네. 이렇게 저를 이 so, 자리에 참여하게끔 해주신 모든 분들께 I would like to thank everyone um, for giving me this opportunity to stand before you. Some of you may expect that I'm going to speak in Korean because I am a Korean um, Spanish translator, but in fact, the, I am pretty poor at Korean, so I'm going, I mean, my level of um, Korean um, is not up to delivering this kind of presentation, so I will be speaking in English. Um, the um, paper which I worked on was entitled Building Communicational Bridges Through Professional Translation to convey some Master De Heng's teaching in COVID-19 pandemics. Um, it was meaningful to, to me and to us, uh, the translation team in Buenos Aires, this idea of uh, being uh, a bridge of communication because we live in in two cultures there, uh, one which is Korean and the other one which is the Spanish, Argentinian Spanish cultural context. So uh, and, uh, we've been working during 20 years in order to convey uh, some Master Deng's teachings. So it was quite meaningful and to be here to share with you about uh, this um, research is an honor. Sorry. Okay. And uh, I want to begin by defining what it means uh, to be ponyok or traducción or translation. All the same, uh, the three uh, words uh, points to, point to, to translate a message from one language to another. In the case of traduction or translation, this word originates from Latin, from the verb transfero, which means to transfer from one place to another. And uh, you can say that uh, um, almost translation is a very integral part of our modern life, because throughout uh, the history of humankind, uh, uh, it, it is what uh, uh, enriches us, as in the past, in the present, and it will going to be in the same way in the future. It enriches us in the different spheres, such as religious, political, economical, social, and cultural aspects. And uh, there are uh, many academics who have been dealing about uh, this theme. For example, uh, Amparo Hurtado Alvir, who is a Spanish translator and an academic, she defines translation in three aspects. Translation is a text, and uh, at the same time, it's an act of communication, and as well as a cognitive activity, because it involves a complex, a complex task of uh, comprehending the message in the original language, and in the case of a translator, as a special kind of a, a communicator, is at the same time the receiver of the message and the producer of the same message in another language. And here we have another academic, Jeremy Mandy, who identifies uh, translation in three aspects. In the first one, it's translation is a subject, or is the subject for all of or a phenomenon. Is at the same time the text, the translated text, and it's it is also a process. But I want to invite you to focus on the approach of uh, some master to hang about uh, translation. It is not a definition by itself, but it's the approach uh, that she had about how to translate her teachings. And she said, uh, as I interviewed uh, um, the head of translation team in the Buenos Aires branch, Venerable Master Hedong, she said, 
recounting what uh, Sonmaster and Dehang said, it is of utmost importance to render a text that is accessible and meaningful to both ad adults and children. And uh, if I uh, would have to talk about the history of translation, it's quite a lengthy theme, so I'm going to uh, make a summary of it. Uh, because translation, the history of translation is focused in two aspects, the translation itself and the study of how to translate. And uh, we can see that uh, the debate about uh, the styles regarding tra translate uh, of free or literal has been um, a debate uh, uh, occurring from the antiquity, and we can go back to Cicero. He, uh, in his uh, work, De Optimus Genere Oratorum, uh, dealt a great uh, about uh, these aspects of uh, the translation. And the another examples that we have is that of Horace, uh, Saint Jerome, or Saint Augustine, all. Um, very important uh, contributors to the spreading of uh, knowledge. And in, in the case of Buddhism, e, we can see that uh, the teachings of uh, the historical Buddha spread out uh, uh, throughout the pan-European uh, continents in the 3rd century BCE, through Indian subcontinent, uh, the Hellenistic kingdoms, Burma, Thailand, China, etc. So we can see that uh, this was a um, current of thinking in which was not focused in one ge geographical place. And we can see uh, again how translation is a very integral part of our human existence. And uh, in these uh, in this aspect, we have uh, two huge uh, or important translators, also uh, practitioners, uh, disciples of uh, Buddha. We have the example of Shua Zhang, Hyun Zhang, and Nagarjuna. They first uh, uh, tried to use the existing terms in the Chinese culture. In the, in the case of uh, Nagarjuna, he tried to coin new terms uh, in order to adapt the teachings uh, to the context of the target language. And uh, if we go to uh, what happened in, with uh, the humanistic movements, we have the examples of uh, uh, academics such as, or translators, Tyndale, Dole, and Luther. Uh, they translated into vernacular languages, the Bible. And uh, in the case of uh, the Romance period, we have uh, the uh, case of uh, a, philosoph a philosopher, a uh, Slemacher of German origin, and the father of the modern Protestant theology, who pointed out uh, two tactics. Um, you can choose to leave the author calmly come in his place and move the reader uh, towards the, the author, which is called uh, a foreignization, and the other round, which is to move the author towards the reader. And this is called uh, domestication. And those are terms coined by an, another academic, uh, Lawrence Benuti. And uh, I will go. Um, in, in England, uh, there was uh, in uh, the 18th century uh, different, uh, again, the, the same uh, debate about uh, how to translate uh, if uh, the style of free or literal, uh, w which one to choose. And, uh, John Bryden came to this triadic model metaphrase, which is to translate word by word and line by line, which is called the literal translation, and paraphrase, which is the Ciceronian sense for sense translation. 
And uh, the third one is imitation, where the translation may express the sources as best they think or fit. And communicators. As you know, the translator is a communicator who tries to bridge the gap between two cultures and two languages and two different contexts. And I want to make an analogy with Sonastor de Heng, who is also a very important communicator of the Dharma from her own experiences of practice to, uh, to convey it to the audience or the general public in uh, um, trying to share her own experience about uh, relying on and trusting her Hamam Chuingong. So, um, okay. As you can say, uh, there are two aspects uh, which uh, characterize uh, the translator and uh, somebody uh, who is a communicator of the Dharma, in this case, of Master De Heng. Both of them are responsible in conveying the accurate, accurate message, uh, and they are in the middle of delivering the message to a desired uh, audience. And this is uh, um, a very important part uh, because we in Buenos Aires always try to convey as faithful as possible her message uh, to the Spanish audience. And uh, I want to mention here something about the linguistic relativity. in the same way as does a Spanish speaker or an English speaker or a German speaker. So uh, as a translator, we have to uh, be very careful about these aspects. And uh, language is a living thing. It's a very dynamic element. So it's constantly changing. And uh, this is another characteristic. And um, for example, there is uh, um, cognitive scientist in the United States. She is a Ukrainian, raised in and formed in the United States, who is called Lera Borodisky. She says that in the world we have 7,000 languages, which means that we have 7,000 different worldviews. And in some way, this, with this linguistic relativity theory, what we can do is to enhance and uh, to um, communicate with each, with each other, provoking uh, these kind of changes through language. And um, she says, and I concurred and agree with her, that this is a very positive view. And in the same way, the teaching of some master, the Heng, can provoke positive uh, changes in the person who uh, decides to apply uh, her teachings or some of uh, the aspects of her teachings in their life as individual beings in, in their familiar, uh, family uh, uh, surroundings or labor world uh, or professional world. And uh, I have uh, uh, problems always with this Korean term, maum, because it means so many things. Sometimes it can be described as a 
feeling or it's a thought, it's a volition and intention. So it always it depends on the context. And in order to grab the right meaning, it is of utmost importance to read and reread the same text from all angles possible. And uh, as you can say, or as Gustavos has said t uh, yesterday, uh, the Korean language always leaves the most new or innovative or important information at last. So this is a very, a very difficult uh, um, situation to solve uh, for a uh, um, person who speaks Spanish, for example, porque, because uh, Spanish it comes from the Romance languages and we have uh, this structure of subject, verb, and object, whereas in Korean, the verb always comes at the end. And, okay. In the case of uh, Samasar de Heng, and uh, in her transmission of Dharma, she had a, a compression, a, other uh, representatives of other religions is enlightenment and liberation, which is uh, an important part uh, and the ultimate purpose of, I think, uh, uh, human existence. And um, in order to achieve this, uh, it is very important that the practice of a non-duality principle which uh, is, uh, or uh, as uh, Venerable Master Heyu explained uh, yesterday, the five Kong principles. And this is life in common, feeling in common, movement in common, body in common, and sustenance in common. Only uh, by practicing this uh, non-duality non principle, we will be able to free ourselves from suffering And I want to make a comparison between the hermeneutic motions of George Steiners, uh, who was a philosopher and a literary critic of Franco-American origin. He described uh, four movements in translation. He said that uh, first, uh, there is initiative trust. creates uh, some kind of imbalance in the system. But uh, this is compensated by the force movement because uh, the balance is restored uh, and enhanced by the uh, translated text. So we, in this way, enlarge the stature of the original text 
And this is what happens uh, by experience with uh, the Spanish text uh, um, in, as regards to uh, some master techniques teachings. Uh, sometimes uh, when, uh, as a Korean speaker, or I read her teachings in Korean, I don't uh, totally grab all the meanings or all uh, the layered or intertextuality in the text. But when I uh, try to translate it, I see all this and I see the better connections or I see where I have to compensate in Spanish in order to deliver her message faithfully. And uh, this was very uh, interesting for me because uh, at the first time or first moment, this was not going to be the, one of the core themes of uh, this presentation. But we can make an analogy with Steiner's movements and the practice of Hamaim Chuingong's movements. Because the practitioner, in order to practice this, have to uh, have initiative faith in uh, his Hamaim Chuingong, because it is the ultimate fundamental mind or Buddha nature, and it transcends time and space and has, has all the answers. And then the practitioners must let go and entrust everything, which is the methodology of Juan, or introspection, as we call it in Spanish. And then, uh, uh, with uh, this introspection and trusting, there is integration and response of all the beings inside the, the body of the practitioner and with all the elements and, and persons outside. So, in these, in, uh, uh, therefore, we move to the fourth movement, which is liberation and enhancement. This changes completely the initial state of the practitioners and uh, gives, gives him the opportunity to move forward uh, pace by pace in his uh, path of practice and liberation. Here we can observe uh, these uh, by excerpts of her Dharma talks, for example, in initiative phase, she says, Buddhism is another name. Because what is important is that we focus on what it points to, to eternal essence. And since it is eternal, it connects us with the universe and with this realm of ours and drives us forward through the principle of feeling in common, or kongsim. And letting go in trusting and introspection. Know that only Hamam Chuingong can guide your body, also in the face of death. Do not be like the immature peapod that stubbornly refuses to open. Have trust that only Hamam Chuingong can lead you to freedom without agony, to split easily, like a ripe pea, peapod that opens with the slightest pruding. You uh, have trust that only your Chuingong can direct you to transcend the pain, to die without pain, to be reborn as an evolving and to attain complete freedom. I therefore encourage you to practice with diligence. The third move, integration and response. She said, I'm not a physician, but I can tell you that if you practice, you will realize there is no spot where disease may adhere. In detail, your body's consciousnesses have no criteria and simply obey the thoughts we make. I wish to emphasize that there is a possibility of recovery precisely for this reason, in spite of your urgent situation. If you have a genuine faith in your essence, I shall become one with you, and all Buddhas, one with you. And with these merits and virtues of practice, you will heal rapidly. Now, if you do not practice, you will only be able to recover from this illness, but you will be incapable of resolving future problems. Therefore, I encourage you to practice. 
And uh, here comes the liberation and enchantment. When the practitioners release the self, millions of matters fall asleep. They rest from them. Nothing is a concern anymore. And um, I want to give a, or I share with you some guidelines and, uh, um, about uh, some uh, um, uh, challenges that we face uh, when translating some masters and teachings. Faithfulness is a very important aspect because uh, you say, oh, I must have translated, but how do I do it? Or which are the parameters? Um, but uh, uh, there is a uh, Spanish academic uh, called uh, Valentin Garcia Chevra who provides us with uh, this golden rule. And he says, it should say everything that the original says, nothing, say nothing that the original does not say, and say it all in the appropriate and natural ways that the target language permits. This uh, rule has proven very useful to us uh, because it's always a challenge, because uh, Korean and Spanish are very different languages from very different traditions. And um, it's important to understand also the dimensions of language functions, because um, in uh, um, the teachings of uh, Thomas de Heng, we have, a, 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 for moments, an informative aspect, expressive aspect, and ap appellative aspects of her teachings. So, uh, the purpose, she says, for example, in an extract of uh, another Dharma talk, the purpose of this practice is for you to comprehend that there is no idea of the past or future, just as there is no idea of the present, because it is emptiness. And my duty is to guide you along this path so that you might realize this truth. And here you can identify the three functions of the language. And uh, about difficulties, sometimes there are some parts of the text which uh, results so difficult uh, to translate that um, many, or, uh, or the first choice is to leave out, to omit, or to compress. But uh, um, there are academics such as Jiri Levy who says it's immoral to omit something of the original message. So in uh, our uh, translation team, we, when we see the minimal possibility to translate, we try to debate and discuss and get the right solution to the problem. Um, and about the specific features of the Korean, uh, Spanish and English language, I want to uh, share this with you. For example, um, from the linguistic point of view, um, the Korean language is some kind of spiral does circles and goes to the center. So in order to understand the full message, you have to keep calm, have patience, and go and, and wait until the speaker delivers the full message. In the case of English, it's a downward arrow, so it is easier to understand subject, word, and object. And in the case of Romance languages, uh, such as Spanish, it is a downward, but crooked arrows, and it splits up, and uh, it draws a kind of plateau. So uh, I think that this is important to understand when you are um, translating from Korean to English, or Spanish, or I don't know the features of German, but the same. Yes, and um, I want to clarify that the translation that we do is only uh, one possibility among others, because uh, in these 20 years of working uh, with Master Hedong, 
we have uh, shifted from one style to another, try to experiment uh, different things that we have encountered. So translation is also evolution and, uh, and it is a cultivation of this study. Um, and uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, um, Argentina uh, has gone through one of the longest or no, longest or largest uh, lockdown from March to December. Um, so we had um, the prohi prohibitions about the dharma gatherings and uh, so many restrictions that we focused only uh, solely in subtitling and uploading some master things uh, dharma talks to uh, YouTube, so you can uh, see that uh, you can find materials in Spanish and in English um, and in French if you if you speak the language. And uh, subtitling is a different kind of translation because you have the restrictions of time, the characters per line, and you have to take in into account uh, the camera cuts the sound, the image, and also the movements. Uh, for example, uh, uh, what uh, some master Te Heng does, if she says yes with her head, you have to, in uh, some way, deliver the same message. Or if she says no, again, the same. So these have proven very, very difficult to synchronize and, um, and, uh, pr um, and give the, the audience the all the conditions so as to feel uh, that they are not uh, um, reading a subtitle text, but feeling, feeling and hearing his, her voice and feeling her, her message. And as a conclusion, um, from the beginning of the, this uh, present work to the end, uh, there have been many changes and shifts in the ideas, what uh, themes to focus on or what to leave out. And I can say you that uh, this has been uh, quite a journey. But uh, I can assure you that this journey didn't begin last year, but uh, 20 years ago when I met uh, the um, Somastor Zeng's teachings and uh, the causality with uh, Venerable Master Hedong. So I want to illustrate this with a final teaching of Sir Master De Heng, which in some way guides us through our path of life. Would there be any reason why the current might wish to go in the reverse way? If a stream meets a rock, it flows, ar it flows around it, right? Both raindrops and the causes of suffering behave in the same way. The water should converge and flow, and in your case, you must release in your essence all the conflicts that you face. Consequently, they and you will reach the ocean. There, thereafter, there will be no distinction and, or discrimination between unclear and pure water or anything else. Once the water has settled, there will simply be clear water. So I want uh, for you to, to take this message of Sir Master De Heng, and uh, the name of our temple, our center is Hammam Sonwon, Hammam Son Center. Hammam is a very meaningful world, which uh, is, um, is somehow the great consciousness that unites us and it's deep within us. So I invite you to work together, to join hands and uh, make uh, this freedom a reality, so may all of you and all beings reach your ocean of peace and freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for a very interesting presentation. So regarding the translation, there is a word that the translation is a rebellion. Uh, so, and she explained about all kinds of difficulties that she experienced uh, through the translation. 
Uh, so I'm sure that it will be a very daunting task to translate the Sun Master Dehing's teachings and Dharma. And because of time constraint, it will take only one question. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Can someone give the master the microphone? It's not a question. It was what I heard in Germany that I, I heard that if you want to search the uh, Buddhist term in Spanish on the internet, then you have to search Kuhyorim, the translator's name, in the Google. Uh, so when I heard that story, I thought that the Kuhyorim is truly a representative uh, translator for Han Maum Sun Center. And also, she's a sort of the recognized figure in the translation for the uh, Buddhist teachings. And today, she shared with us all kinds of um, um, afflictions and also the considerations and contemplations that she has poured on her translation work. I felt that it's nothing different from the practice and meditation. And also this shows that this international conference is not just a play with word, but that it's truly the moment of awakening and enlightenment. And in this sense, I would like to thank everyone uh, who have contributed to this conference and also the translation team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Because of the time constraint, we will conclude the first presentation of session four.